things, as I say all the time, but uh, for the most part, most of our diet is going verse by verse, line by line through books. And Romans is taking us a really long time, right, Annette? Where's Annette? She's not here. Oh, there you are. Yes, I know. It's taking us a really long time, I've heard. But it's, a, it's an awesome uh, letter from the Apostle Paul to the uh, church in, in Rome. And so we're going to continue looking at it. And last week, just to catch you up in case you weren't here, this is what we looked at, is how can suffering be a part of a good God's plan for our lives? And, uh, and, and verses that, that I'll key in on one verse, and it was this one here in Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things, good things, bad things, all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. Um, that's an important distinction right there of those who love Him. And those who love Him are the ones who have been called according to His purpose. And we looked at what His purpose was uh, for the suffering and for the joy and all the things we go through in life. Uh, his purpose and His plan was to uh, transform us into the image of His Son, build us in the character of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so that was His good plan. Um, and here's what we said then. The bottom line from last week was this. The suffering that we do in this life is never good, right? It's never good to be diagnosed with cancer. It's never good to be in an automobile accident. It's never good to be run over by a tractor, right? It's never good that any of those things happen. But because of God, the results of those bad things can be good. That we can grow in His likeness. Uh, in the likeness of His Son, that God's plan can be furthered. And you know what? The thing that happened to us and the suffering may not be good, but the results of it can be good because of God and His plan. So, here's the question for us today. It's the big but. But, how can we be sure that God will work all things for our good? Now I'm talking, this was written to believers, to people who were Christians in the church, and as they're suffering, as they're going through these things, how can they be sure that God is really going to work these things out for good? And the reason I say that is obvious because sometimes something tragic happens in our life, whether it's an abuse, um, whether it's a tragedy, whether it's an accident, whether it's a divorce, who knows what could happen, how you could be, you know, impacted by sin. And the question is, it may be years before you have the answer. It may be years before you see the good that comes out of it. How can you be sure that God has used that for good if you're a believer? I mean, how can we have the faith? How can we have the trust in God um, during those times of, of suffering when, you know, you just don't understand what God is doing. You just can't imagine how we could ever turn this thing into good, how we could ever use this for your good or how this could be for your good or His glory. So how can we be sure? Well, you need to know something about God's plan of salvation in order to, to have some confidence in, in the fact that God is working for your good. If you're a believer here, you need to know something about God's plan of salvation. And so this is where Paul points the believers in Rome, and he points them toward God's plan of salvation. And, and here's what you're going to see, that if you don't know this thing about God's plan of salvation, there's something that if you don't know about it, uh, that you might struggle with worry. You might struggle with fear. You might have doubts and anxiety as you're going through times of tribulation, as you're going through trouble. You might be um, wavering uh, as you struggle about whether or not God is good, about whether or not God has your good in mind, because sometimes the things that happen to us in this life just destroy us. You've been abandoned. You've been abused. Uh, you've been hurt. Um, and, 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 you know, you've lost a child. You've been abandoned by a parent. Whatever it is that happens to happen, how can you, we as believers um, have faith that God has our good in mind through those things even that seem like they serve no purpose, like they're counter to what God's plan would be or counter to what it would be meant for our good? Well, Paul picks up here in Romans 8, uh, verse 29, and like I said, he points them toward God's plan of salvation. And if you've never thought about this, this is a good time to think about it. For those who God foreknew, 
he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, you'll remember last week we ended with this verse, if you were here last week, and, and we just focused on one part of it. This week we're focusing on the other part of it, and that's this. We need to talk about what foreknew meant. And, and what is Paul talking about here when he said he foreknew? Well, Christians kind of disagree about this one, about what foreknew meant. But here's what we're going to talk about today. He foreknew, meaning number one, he either, God either, before the creation of the world, either knew who it was that would choose him because God is outside of time. God is not bound by time. And so he can look at all of human history and knows who it is that will choose him or the other side of the coin would be this that that God knows in eternity past before the creation of the world who he would choose who he would choose to have mercy on who he would choose to save so that's the two sides here both camps are Christian both camps are brothers and sisters in the Lord and you may disagree about what my take is on, on it, but I'm going to give you this first uh, and explain this to you. And this is an oversimplification of it, but it's something you probably need to consider. You need to search the scriptures, you need to pray about, and you need to talk about because we need to understand something about God's plan of salvation, um, not for it to work. For example, I can turn this light on and off and not understand why that light is going on and off. I just know I flipped the switch. You know, um, but understanding a little bit about how that light works can help me. And that's what we're going to see here. It can help me have confidence that if there's electricity running to that light, all I need to do is flip the switch and it will turn on. So, um, foreknew and predestined. Um, here's what we're going to look at. See, the first thing we have to get out of the way is this. Is God, in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, God would want all people to be saved. See, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Well, if God wants everyone to be saved, here's the dilemma. If God wants everyone to be saved um, and he's God and can do whatever he wants, why isn't everyone saved? And why doesn't everyone come to a knowledge of the truth? Good question. And then in John 6, 44, um, uh, Jesus says this, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. Well, you know, which is which here? Well, there's two different camps, and one would point to, yes, that, you know, not everyone can come to Jesus, and the other one would say, well, but God wants everyone to be saved. And, and so, here's what we're going to look at. And like I said, this is an oversimplification, but it's something that you should probably start thinking about and working through, looking at Scripture, coming up with where you fall in this. And this is the doctrine of predestination and election. And I don't know if any of you guys, especially those of you that are recently saved, um, have thought about this before, but who chooses who's going to be saved and who's not? Uh, there's two options, either God chooses or we choose. And the first thing I need to tell you is this, that you know what, um, both camps are brothers in the Lord. Both camps are in Orthodox Christianity. Neither one of them's a heretic. They're both brothers. And we agree on um, many things, um, but we don't agree necessarily about this because, you know, um, uh, it's not absolutely essential for me to know where the electricity comes from and how it's generated. But it is necessary for me to know that without electricity, that light won't go on. So here's the, the, uh, um, the doctrine of predestination and election. Um, two different uh, theologians. One is the, uh, here's what I want you to see, the line going across here, okay? And um, both of those camps would be in Orthodox Christianity. I'll explain to you in a minute what I mean by that. But if you go too far past that one way, you fall into heresy. If you go too far the other way, you are outside of the bounds of the Bible also and fall into heresy. But 
Both of those are brothers, both of those are believers, both of those camps, anyone that holds either one of those two opinions will be in heaven with us one day um, because they believe and they agree on uh, sin, salvation, and faith in Christ as the means for, for salvation. And so either one. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you where I fall yet, but I'm going to tell you that I started out over here on the Arminian side. And so what happens is that side, if you've ever wondered why there's more than one Protestant denomination, um, this is part of the reason why. Because the founders on, on one side of certain denominations, like John Wesley, Charles Wesley, that would be like the Methodist side. Um, that would be the side um, that a lot of uh, Pentecostal kind of churches are on, that the, the side that that um, uh, many uh, Assembly of God type churches are on. And then the other side is the Calvinist side where there would be a lot more, uh, well, you know, the Lutherans would be closer to that side, at least Martin Luther would be. And then um, uh, the Reformed churches are on that side. Um, a lot of uh, Reformed Baptists are over on that side. And so the question that they disagree about is this. Who chooses, God or us? And there's really only two choices, you know, God or us. Do we choose to be saved? Because from my perspective, when I was saved, it seemed like I chose God. Um, that's where I was on the Arminian side at one time. And what they would highlight would be this. What's very important to that side, um, they would choose the verses in the Bible that emphasize our choosing that, you know, for me and my house, we, you know, follow the Lord or whatever, whatever it would be, but they would emphasize the verses that say that we choose because what's very important to them is man's free will and ability to choose and God's goodness because, you know, God is good and he will let us decide. Now, the other side of that would be the Calvinist side and, um, or the Reformed side or whatever you want to call it, but the other side of that spectrum um, would be God's will is the most important. God's will has the last decision and not our will. And God's sovereignty is what's emphasized, meaning that God is the boss. He's in charge. He has the final word. Um, and so those are two sides. Um, and there are other people all along, you know, somewhere in between the two of those. I used to be closer to the Arminian side, but now I'm actually closer to the Calvinist side. Um, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Here's the problem. When they disagree about who chooses, whether it's God or us, um, the problem with the Arminian side is this, um, uh, the problem of sinful will. See, both sides would agree, and everyone in between there would agree that, that um, our will has been tainted by sin. And so we don't have a good, you know, will. Human nature is fallen, you know, since the, since the fall of Adam. And so, um, when we choose, we don't choose God. When we choose of our own free will, we don't choose God. Um, in Ro Paul told us in, earlier in Romans, if you remember, all have gone astray. None seek after God. And so, um, the problem is we don't choose God of our own free will. So, what the... Uh, Arminians would believe or someone closer to that end of the spectrum believes is that at some point in everyone's life God steps in and he gives what they would call prevenient grace and that means that he would open up our will for a, for a brief time um, separate the sin from it so to speak and allow us to have a free decision whether or not we choose God or not and that's how they get around the the uh, the idea of um, our fallen human nature and how um, we can still choose God. Now, um, the the problem or with uh, uh, with uh, as far as our sinful will goes on the other side, the Calvinists. Here's what they believe: they believe that it's not us that choose; that God gave everyone free will, and we all chose death. We all chose hell. We all chose sin. But God, in his mercy, chose some to spare and trumped their will because his will is more important than theirs, than their free will. Um, that's the side I'm leaning to now. Uh, but anyway, um, the problem then uh, with that side is the problem of free will. 
So does our choice matter or not if we don't have free will? If God chose us and we didn't cho choose him? So that's kind of in a nutshell, an oversimplification. But in my experience, when I was first saved, I went to a Methodist church and, uh, and I was more toward the Armenian side. And from my perspective, I was saved by um, choosing God and placing my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know, I saw my sinfulness and, you know, I, uh, you know, chose God. But that means that I could look at others and say, what's the matter with that idiot? Why didn't they choose? I mean, as I've grown in my faith, I've preached uh, sermons before and uh, that seemed so simple, even my dog would say, I repent, you know, but yet there are other people who haven't, you know, responded the way that I thought they should have responded. And it makes more sense to me now that, you know what? It's God that allows people to respond. Now, maybe from the Armenian side of the spectrum, you could say, well, perhaps God has not opened up their will yet and given them the opportunity to choose, and that could be so. So, um, but from my perspective now, looking back on when I was saved, when I was a sinner, I remember I did not want anything to do with church. I did not want anything to do with God. I did not want anything to do with any pastors or any priests or any, uh, any um, you know, anybody who was a Christian, to be honest with you, because I thought that um, they could see my sin, and I was perfectly happy in my sin, just the way I was, and I didn't want to think about my guilt, and I didn't want to think about my death and eternity or any of that kind of thing. And then one day, I remember thinking to myself, I'm really curious about that. What does God's word say about that? Who is Jesus? And, and searching for different things and being interested in things that I had no interest in before. And what I believe now happened was this, that God overrode my free will. And against my free will, he chose me. You could disagree with me, but from my perspective, in my sinful state, I never would have chosen God. And I didn't. I had many opportunities, and I didn't. But what I believe is that he chose me. Why? I've got no idea because I'm the biggest sinner I know. There are plenty of people out there that are far better and far moral than me that are not Christians. And I've got no idea why he chose me over them. But I can tell you this, that I never would have chosen him. It, it, just from where I am in life right now, that's what I believe. And I continually fail. So it's not like he looked and said, well, this is going to be a good guy someday. I should choose him. Because that's not true. So you may disagree with me about who chooses, but what I want you to do is search the scriptures, pray, think about it, and say, who does choose? Did I choose God or did God choose me? And there's lots of implications for this, even as far as evangelism goes, because um, if it was up to me to convince people to follow God, um, I don't think I could do it. Now, I'm not that smart of a guy. I'm not that good of an arguer. Um, I don't think I could convince anyone to follow God. But if, like God promises me, he has elect people out there, and all I need to do is not convince them, but flip the switch and the current flows, then you know what? That gives me hope because I don't have to convince anyone, and all I have to do is bring the gospel to them and God will call them and do his work in them. Well, how do you know which ones are which? You don't. It's like if I had a, a row of lamps up here, I thought about doing that, putting a row of lamps up here and only plugging a couple of them in, you know, in order to see which ones turn on, I'm gonna have to turn the switch on every one. And the one that comes on, oh, that was one. That's the way that I view it now. So. Um, that's the doctrine of predestination or electron, uh, election um, very simply and oversimplified but I want you to start thinking about it so and those he predestined that's those who in eternity past he knew them and when, when Paul talks about knew them he doesn't seem to be talking about at least from my perspective he doesn't seem to be talking about well he knew who would pick them he seems to be talking about he knew them the way that God knew Noah 
back in the Bible, it says that, um, back in the Old Testament, I mean in Genesis, it says that, um, that uh, God looked upon the earth and men did wicked continually. All men were evil. Well, that would include Noah, wouldn't it? But then the next verse says, but Noah found favor in God's sight. Well, that means that God had grace on him, undeserved, unmerited grace, doesn't it? That for some reason, God chose Noah. Was it because Noah wasn't a sinner? Well, if you read children's storybook Bibles, maybe it's true. But if you read the real Bible, it's not true. God, uh, it, Noah sinned even after he got off the ark, and God saved him. Uh, he got drunk, fell asleep in his tent naked, and something horrendous happened to him that we won't get into right now. But um, so it wasn't that he wasn't, it wasn't that Noah was um, good, it was that God was good and God chose Noah. Well, some versions of the Bible say this, that, that, um, that Noah was righteous in God's sight. That means he was a good person, right? Well, actually, um, we who place our faith and trust in Christ for our justification are considered righteous in God's sight, and we're not, not sinners, are we? We are sinners, but for some reason, God chose us. It's same as he chose Noah. It's same as he chose Abraham to be the father of the Jews. Abraham came from a pagan family. Nobody in his family worshipped the true God. Um, but for some reason, God chose to be gracious to Abraham um, and to build his family from Abraham. So... Those he predestined, those he knew in the past, he predestined them that said their ultimate destiny would be to look like my son Jesus Christ, to grow in his character, to grow in his likeness, and one day they'll be glorified the way he is. So those he predestined, he also called, and called means this, effectively called means they heard the gospel, they heard God's word, and they responded to it. Now, whether you believe that they responded to God's word because they made the right decision, or they responded to God's word because um, God changed and gave them a new heart and a new will with new desires, which is what I think that I experienced. Out of that new heart and those new desires and that new will, we are able to choose God, but only because he chose us first. And so that's what I believe now. You don't have to agree with me. But you should search the scriptures and come to the, to the conclusion on your own between the Holy Spirit and what you find in the scriptures. So those he predestined, he also called. He called them to be his. And those he called, he also justified. And justified, of course, means this, that each one of us is born a sinner. We have inherited sin from Adam, that we inherited guilt, and we inherited um, being under the wrath of God even before we ever sin, because we sin because we're a sinner, we don't become a sinner when we sin. And so um, God justified those that he called and that responded to his call. And the way he did it was by sending his son to the cross to die in our place for our sins. So, you know what? I broke God's law. I went my own way. I rebelled you know, and wanted nothing to do with God, but even when I was God's enemy, God sent his son to the cross to die in my place and to die for my sins so that one day when God changed my heart, put a new heart and new will in me, that I would um, have my sins paid for by what he did for me in my place. So now I'm justified before God because God can look at me just as if I never sinned because he can see... Christ's uh, record instead of my record. That I have the book of Christ's life. He gave me his perfect record and he took my sinful record of my life and he nailed it to the cross and paid for those sins. And, he, and those he justified, he also glorified. And he says this in the past tense as if it already happened. Like, you can bet on it. Like, this is the normal progression of the Christian's life. This is the Christian life cycle. And so if you've been born, you can bet that 
you're going to be glorified if you've been born again. You can, you can take it to the bank, is what he's saying, in the past sense that those he predestined before creation, he called them at some point during their life, and once he called them and they responded, that he also justified them, and those he justified, he also glorified. So, here's a couple possible questions about this that we'll deal with. How do I know if I was predestined by God? Because I've already gotten a couple questions about this. Well, how do I know I'm among the elect? And people are very concerned and worried about it. And, um, and, and it was actually, this was meant to encourage and to calm um, and to give confidence in people that were suffering, not to cause them to worry or be concerned. Um, so how do I know if I was predestined by God? Here's how, watch. If this is the Christian life cycle, predestined, called, justified, glorified. A couple uh, years ago, um, I grew up in a strange kind of family. My family kind of fell apart because of divorce and things. And my mother, my birth mother, took my photo album of all my baby pictures and my kids' pictures and stuff like that with her, um, and they were gone. So for years they were gone, and there were no pictures of me as a kid or as a baby or anything like that. Uh, and then a couple years ago, probably like two years ago, I got that photo album back from my mother, and my kids, um, who are, you know, you know my children, my three children, they were looking at the photo album, and they couldn't believe these pictures. I know some of them said to me, my daughter said, I can't imagine you were ever young. Like, thank you, honey, I love you too. But, 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 but the point of the story was that, um, you know, I can't imagine that you were, and then she kept going, like, my goodness, this was you as a baby? I'm like, well, yeah, I remember being a teenager. I don't remember being a baby. And I definitely don't remember, you know, um, being a fetus. But I'm sure, because I'm here today, that I was all of those things. And you know what? I'm also sure and guaranteed that in the future, I'll be a corpse, that I'll be dead one day and in the ground someday. I'm sure of that too because, uh, you know, that is the, the life cycle of a human on the, fallen, on the fallen earth, right? And so if you were called by God and if you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you are now justified because, not because you did anything, not because you earned it, but because Christ paid for your sin on the cross, then you know what? Then you're somewhere in the life cycle of a Christian, and even though you don't remember it, you were predestined in eternity past. Just like I don't remember ever being, you know, an infant. I don't remember ever being, you know, a fetus, but I'm sure that because I'm a human being, I was those things just because that is the life cycle. And just like I'm sure one day I'll be a corpse, I'm sure one day I'll be glorified because that is the life cycle of a follower of Christ. So that's how you can know whether or not you were predestined by God. The, the next thing is this. If you were predestined, or if some were predestined to heaven, were some predestined to hell? That's a tough question, and we're going to look at that one in about two weeks. But just to bring that up to you, um, if some were predestined to heaven, were some also predestined to hell? Here's what all Christians, regardless of where you fall on that scale, would agree on. That when it comes to God's plan of salvation, if you're a believer, God has always been working for your good. He has always been working for the good of His elect, even when we didn't know we were elect, even before the creation of the earth, and even after, up until Jesus comes, I guess you could say, after our, our conversion. So God worked for the good of those that he called in the distant past, before creation, in predestination, in determining what the, the destination of the people that he called would be. Um, and in the recent past, in our conversion, in calling us through the gospel call, in our effective call, and in justifying us by sending Christ to the cross, and then uh, the great exchange where Jesus took our sin and we took his righteousness. And then in the future, where Christ in Christ's return, where we will finally be glorified because, you know what, if 
if you're alive on this earth, you're still sinning, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. You will still sin. But once we are glorified and our, the job of God glorifying us and transforming us completely into the image and reflection of His Son, Jesus Christ, in character, then that will be the end, and, and that's when he's, what He's working toward. So, how can we be sure that God will work all things for our good? How can you be sure? Well, knowing how He worked for our good and continues to work for our good in His plan of salvation should give us the ability to trust that God is working for our good in all circumstances. That He knew, He either knew that you would choose Him or He knew you and chose you in eternity past. That this isn't a, a, a plan that God is making up as He's going along. But all along, He's been working for your good. Well, you know what? What about being abandoned by my mother? What about abuse? What about disappointment? What about tragedy? What about accidents? All along, He's been working for our good. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and if you love Him. So, that's what He tells us. So, this should give us the ability to trust God is working for our good, not just in salvation, but in all circumstances, even when we don't see it or understand it. So let me tell you about my cat. <laughs> if you love your family, get a dog. I have a dog and I have two cats. I don't care for cats anymore. Um, but over the last year or two, Jen and I have had some huge vet bills because of different things. My dog getting involved in porcupines, a thing with my cat. My cat got blocked up by something and couldn't use the bathroom, couldn't pee. And uh, its kidneys started to shut down and its nose was turning like because it wasn't filtering blood anymore, its nose and its skin were turning um, like bright red, you know, like almost brown um, because of all the stuff that was in its blood. So we bring it to the vet. I don't even like cats. I don't really, not that I don't care for this cat, but cats are not my favorite. I'm a dog guy, right? So, but we bring this, bring the cat to the vet. Um, we get the operation done that unblocks it and hopefully it's going to live. We don't even know or not. Um, and they do all kinds of things to it. Um, of course, the cat doesn't want anything done to it, right? But it has to have it done in order to survive. And so now we bring the cat back home and, um, and now we have to give it this medicine and treat it a certain way for a certain period of time so that it will recover and get better. Um, otherwise, it's not going to make it. Um, and this cat... Um, does not particularly like to have pills and medicine and things put in its mouth, you know? But I've got to get this cat, find it, wrestle it out from wherever it is, hold it down, and against its will, my will is to put this medicine in its mouth so that it will get better, and it will recover, and it will live. Now, um, if me being a wicked sinner that does not even care for cats um, can have the mercy um, to override the will of this cat because I know what's good for it better than it does and give it what it needs rather than what it wants for its own good, then I have to believe that a God who sent his son to the cross to die for a sinner like me um, would have the same goodwill in mind when he overrode my will to save me from death and hell and the sin that I chose. See, the way that I see it is this. Um, that humanity, me specifically will say, was like the toddler that the father brings to the park and says, stay by me and you'll be safe. Stay here with me and don't go near the highway. And of course, like every other toddler, I would look at him and smile and run as fast as I could toward that highway to have my own will be done. 
not knowing that I was running right into traffic to be killed. But that was my will. And if God, like the good father that he's explained to be in the Bible, trumped my will and grabbed me just as I was about to be hit by a truck or a car by the back of the shirt and yanked me back to safety, how could I possibly say that that is not a good God? Just because he over trumped, his will trumped my will for my good. The bottom line is this. This is my bottom line. You may disagree. But if I can trust that God works all things for my good, or I can trust that God works all things for my good, because when it came to salvation, God chose for my good to give me what I needed and not what I wanted or deserved. I wanted death. I wanted to remain in my sin. I didn't want to come to God. And the perfect poster child for this is the Apostle Paul for how this works. The Apostle Paul, it certainly doesn't seem like he chose God. It seemed like God chose him because he was on his way when he was converted to persecute Christians as he had done before. And suddenly, God grabbed him by the back of the shirt and ripped him away from, from uh, 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 hell and sin and gave him a new heart so that he chose God. That's what I believe God did for me, and that's what I believe he does for all believers. I can trust God works all things for my good because when it came to salvation, God chose my good for my good to give me what I needed and not what I wanted or deserved. So, what to do? Well, if you're not a Christian, thank you for coming. You're the one that we're here for. Um, I'm happy that you are here. Please continue to come, continue to learn, continue to ask questions. There's nothing wrong. In fact, it is good to have questions and doubts and to get them answered and to work through them and to search the scriptures and to pray. It is a good thing to do that. When everyone believes the same exact thing, you know what they call that? A cult. There is room, you know, under the same roof for us to have slightly different opinions. And when we get to heaven, then we will see who's right or it probably won't even matter at that point. As long as we all agree on salvation through faith in Christ alone. So if you're not a Christian, thank you for coming. And if you're curious about how salvation works, well, the old way that they would say it is this, repent and believe. But I think that today, um, the, the, the gist of those words, they sound like old words. What I mean by that is this, what repent means was to turn away, to turn away from your sin. But when people think of turning away from your sin, they think of things like, okay, I need to stop doing this and stop doing that and don't do this anymore and don't do that anymore and I need to clean myself up and then believe in God or believe in Christ. But that's not exactly what it means. Uh, here's a better way that I like to frame it and that's this, admit and trust. So admit that you can't save yourself. Admit, because, you know, it's not that you're just turning away from, you know, whatever sin that you have, because it's still sin when you try to do good things to earn God's favor. Because you're saying that I can get there myself, I can atone for my own sin, I don't need Jesus to die on the cross for me. And God would not have sent him if there were any other way. He wouldn't have sent his son to the cross. So admit that you can't save yourself and then trust that Jesus can. Trust that, you know what, I can put my whole weight in, in my relationship with God in what Jesus did for me on the cross. I don't need to help him. I don't need to clean up my life. I don't need to do this thing or not do that thing. God will change me. Now, if you are a Christian... Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about this this week as you search the scriptures and as you pray and as you're convicted by the Holy Spirit. Will we spend eternity being thankful that we made the right choice? 
we're thankful that our good God chose us out of unmerited grace. Consider that question this week. See, imagine if we actually believed that God was working all things for our good. Um, imagine the worry that would disappear when we were going through times of trial. Imagine how the fears you had about the future would tend to disappear. Imagine about how you would doubt God's goodness when something bad happens to you. And imagine how your faith would increase if you trusted that, you know what? God had my good in mind even when I didn't. That's a God that we can trust has our best interest in mind even when we're going through trying things. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, we pray that you would um, instill upon us um, how much you loved us, how much you've done for us, how even as we're suffering and going through things and we may not see for years the good that comes from the hurt that we go through, we may not even see it in this lifetime. But Lord, we pray that you would give us the eyes to see it eventually. And we pray that until that time comes that you would give us the faith to try.